pretty much straightforward. You can't break the laws of nature. You can only prove the laws of nature. If you try to break the laws of nature, nature will break you. You step off the roof and go, I'm going to fly. No, you're not. You're going to fall. And you're going to fall every single time. It's a law. There's a reason they call it the law of nature. They don't call it the theory of nature or the hypothesis of nature. And what we find is that every dietary lifestyle program works. They all work. But they work to the degree that they follow the laws of nature. Most people get rather egocentrical about their programs that they teach and they add in their own little quirks and their own little specialty parts to it to make it their own program. We don't. We don't have a special program that we can say, oh, it's ours. It's not ours. It's nature's program. And I can't add something to it that will improve on it. And so we don't have gimmicks or gadgets or supplements or anything special or certain types of meals or packages or ways of putting it together that we go, oh, well, and this makes it even better. It doesn't. It's already perfect the way it's set up. And it will work perfectly for everyone who follows the program. It's rather interesting. It's kind of in the, in, in the fitness world, we basically rely on the fact that if you do what I do, you'll get what I get. If you practice that golf swing just the way that I practice my golf swing, you'll end up with a golf swing that's as good as or better than mine. Certainly within the degree that your body will allow it to happen. If you train like I train, you'll get the fitness response that I get. And we rely on that so much. And then in nutrition we go, well, everybody's different. How? Okay, we're all different. There's about, according to some of the people who study this differences, there's about a million and a half differences between you and me. It's pretty cool. Okay, you know there's about 10 quadrillion similarities between you and me, which makes the differences, makes the differences statistically zero. It's such a small number, it's like 0. 0.0000001 compared to the similarities, which is 99.9999999. There's a diet. I think they call it uh, blood type diet. <laughs> and we know for certain that there's lots of different blood types amongst cows. And we know there's lots of different blood types amongst all sorts of different creatures out there. The biggest difference is genetically amongst all humans that there could ever be is between you and I. Men and women, that's, that's huge. If we were going to set up different diets, we go, well, listen, women eat this way, men eat that way, because that's the obvious, that's the difference. And nobody's ever suggesting such a thing. And in the whole science of comparative anatomy, they use a, a guideline of similars that allows things to to make more sense. Basically, they say that any animal that is anatomically and physiologically similar to another animal will thrive on similar foods. Now, we know a donkey and a mule and a horse are related. They're similar creatures. They're not identical, but they're similar. But if you put them in a field, they're going to eat similar foods. If you put cows and horses in the same field, they won't eat identically. In fact, horses eat differently than cows. But you put them out in a pasture and they're both perfectly happy. It's pretty darn close compared to if you put an alligator in a field with a horse. This comparative anatomical studies actually, when scientists refer back to it, they go, 
all animals that are anatomically and physiologically similar thrive on similar foods except people. And I go, well, how come except people? And they go, uh, got no good answer for that, but obviously people eat differently than the creatures that are anatomically and physiologically similar, so it must be except people. I go, yeah, but how come? Got no response, got no answer. There is no reason. If we look at the anthropoid primates, those that are the tailless primates, the ones that are anatomically and physiologically most like us, in terms of anatomy and physiology, the closest to us is the bonobo. Next is the chimp, the next is the orangutan, and the next is the gorilla, although a lot of people say, oh, the gorilla, you know, that, that's a, and we relate us to gorilla. We're not that close to gorillas. What's interesting to me, though, is if instead of anatomy and physiology, we go to genetics, and we organize these creatures in terms of their closeness to us by genetics, what we come up with is gorilla, orangutan, chimpanzee, bonobo, and then us. Where the gorillas only share about 98% of our genetic material. And the orangutan, 98.5, and the chimpanzee, 99. The bonobo and current meters are sharing somewhere between 99.5 and 99.7 of the same genetic material as us. They're really close to us. They're spooky close to us. It's, it's interesting to see how they eat then based on this. But before we do that, we want to look at one more indicator called noetics. Now, noetics are the study of intelligence. And when they use noetics to arrange these creatures according to their intelligence, what they come up with is gorilla, orangutan, chimpanzee, bonobo has the intelligence of about an eight-year-old human, and then us. Mm -hmm. Well, the pattern seems to hold true no matter how we look at these creatures. They line up in the same organizational plan. And when we go to food, we see an interesting thing arranged, or an interesting thing shown to us, which is that these creatures eat a diet of whole, fresh, ripe, raw, organic plants. They don't eat only plants. Most of them eat about 1% of their entire diet coming from things that are not plants. Insects, bugs, little creatures, reptiles, even a monkey now and then if it starts competing for their food. But it's about 1% of their total calories. I'm not as concerned with the 1% as I am with the 99, obviously. And if you want to eat 1% of your diet from bugs, you have my, you're probably eating more bugs than you know you're eating. But in terms of food, what we find out is that these creatures eat a diet strictly of fruits and vegetables the 99% anyway. And their fruits and vegetables are made up basically like this. Gorillas eat vegetables with a little bit of fruit. Orangutans eat vegetables and a substantial amount of fruit. Chimpanzees eat fruit with a fair amount of vegetables. Bonobos eat fruit and a little bit of vegetables. Bonobos eat about 5% of their total dietary caloric intake from vegetables and 95% of their caloric intake 
coming from fruit. I've got the equipment to pick an apple. Collecting an apple doesn't take me much time. It pleases my senses. It's got texture, it's got taste, it's got color, it's got smell, it's, it's ergonomically fits right in. It's the right sized unit for me. It, how long would that take you to collect enough flax seeds to make a meal? They're not really to scale with human consumption. Fruits and vegetables are. Doesn't mean we can't eat them sometimes. Chimpanzees eat insects, they eat ants and termites, but it's not the bulk of their diet. If we see this pattern and we see everything starting to work out by all the different sciences, if we want to actually look and go, what the heck is our dietary design? We don't have to trust our senses, we can trust the science and go, it's pretty obvious we're designed to eat fruit and a little bit of vegetable matter.